Good afternoon if you're uh, in Europe, good morning if you're stateside, and good evening if you're crazy enough to be in Asia watching the session. Uh, this is a hard talk session, Building the Telco of the Future and Operational Roadmap. My name is Mark Newman, I'm Chief Analyst at TM Forum. Uh, a huge thanks to our distinguished panellists. Thank you so much for finding time today. Uh, I know we're all crazily busy than ever, but thank you so much, as I say, thank you to Danielle, to Sudhir, to Antonietta, to Sam. Um, rather than me introducing you all, I'm going to give you all, if you just give us 30 seconds on you, your company, in no particular order, I'm starting at the top of my screen where Danielle happens to be. Danielle. Hi, I'm Danielle Royston. Everyone calls me DR. Um, I am the uh, telco public cloud evangelist, right? So I believe that the public cloud is coming to telco, and I talk about that all the time, and I'm excited to talk about it today with you, Mark. Thanks, Danielle. Antonietta. Hello, I'm Antonietta and I'm the Chief Digital and IT Officer of uh, uh, Proximus. I'm very happy to be with all of you today and to exchange ideas. Thanks, Sudhir. Hey, hello, I'm Sudhir Kumar Mittal. I'm the uh, Chief Architect in Airtel. Airtel is the biggest, one of the biggest operators across the world. Airtel operates in um, largely in India, of course, and in Asia, other countries like Bangladesh and Sri Lanka and in Africa uh, at about 15 places and the uh, rest of the world at six points of presence. So uh, I'm looking after the end-to-end um, the -end architecture in the engineering of Airtel. Thank you, Sudeh. Sam? Hello, everybody. My name is Sam Lakundi. I am uh, the Vice President of Innovation at uh, BMC and our focus around uh, the 32 locations we have globally around the world uh, is to focus on uh, with the telcos on the IT side as well as the network side. So we create solutions for our telcos globally that address these markets uh, uh, for, for the, the various needs. Thank you, Sam. And just so that you can help visualize where we are all today, Danielle, as you can see, is in downtown Austin. Sudhir is just outside Delhi. Uh, Antonietta, I guess you're in Brussels. And Sam is in Florida, in Orlando. So we have a nice, diverse audience today, or diverse panel, I should say, today. Now, in terms of how we'll handle the next hour or so, we love these sessions to be interactive. So uh, if you have any questions, comments, uh, then please, please, please use the Q&A box, and I'll pick them up uh, on an ongoing basis. So I'm, I'm not going to wait until the end. If there's questions that pop up, I will ask you the questions. Um, We'll use up the whole hour, but Antonietta has to drop off for a board meeting, which I think we'll forgive her for on this occasion. So thank you so much, Antonietta, for finding time. So I'm going to point a lot of conversation the first half hour towards Antonietta, uh, and then when she drops off, obviously, we'll, we'll balance it out. But uh, we have a lot to get through. So the, the topic today, uh, an operational roadmap for telco of the future. Wow. I mean, what a big question that is, you know, and in many ways, we used to talk about transformation a lot. Maybe we still talk about transformation a lot, but increasingly we talk about um, operating models, operational roadmaps. And I like to think of this as the how, as the how to do what you want to do. Uh, and so, um, so, so maybe a good place for me to start is to ask you all in different ways, you know, how ready are we as an industry? Are we ready to embrace these operational roadmaps? Do we know precisely where we're going? So I'll put that question to you first, Antonietta, if you don't mind. Yes, and uh, uh, this is very interesting question indeed, Mark. As you said, the telecom world is drastically changing and uh, also the data and AI is playing a very, very important role, not only for the efficiency, but also for expanding the business. Uh, on top of that, we see many uh, different industry and also uh, some competitors that are getting together. Uh, so I really do believe that the future of telco goes very much into the ecosystem. Into the ecosystem means leveraging the power of the network to create and spill over digital services all over the life of, uh, of people. Uh, of course, the question is that what that means in terms of an IT architecture uh, and uh, in particular, telecom operator, they come from uh, 
kind of siloed architecture which has been built based on connectivity. And now all of a sudden you request the same architecture to be very horizontal, to be a super integrator. Uh, and then I guess, uh, at least for me, this is the key. It's really transforming uh, the, the telecom architecture from vertical into horizontal. Uh, invest a lot in the integration part because also in the future, it's really, really important to be able to integrate every sort of service. So building some sort of uh, technology agnostic integration and, and focus also on, uh, on uh, ecosystem because in, I think in the future will be quite difficult to have uh, all the skills and capability now to, to build everything you need. Uh, so uh, eventually more and more you will go and pick and choose the best solution but then you have to be able to integrate them with fast time to market and in an efficient way, in an effective way. Uh, and that's where the uh, architecture also and the telco world has to be uh, ready. So thank you, Antonietta. I mean, that sounds, if I just come back to you, I mean, that's a hugely ambitious statement, scene setting, if you like. And, uh, and it's telcos addressing all of these new opportunities in different verticals, partnerships and architecture for that. I mean, I think if it was my job to be CIO or a chief architect, my head would explode with the sheer number of options that, that I have in front of me. So I guess it's a question of prioritizing, Antonia, is, is that fair or is it? And I guess maintaining openness, I guess, as well is very important. Yes, no, I fully agree with you. It's really in particular maintaining openness, openness in terms of, of a partnership, in terms of, of solution openness also to constantly look at the market and see uh, you know, who is specialized in what and, and partner, uh, and also openness in terms of continuous reskilling uh, of people uh, to be able also to adjust so much to, to so much uh, fast changing uh, technology. So definitely openness, uh, it's, uh, it's the right word and the right concept to, to explore. And uh, it's also new for all of us because we were very much used to have uh, our own beautiful architecture, you know, fully integrated. Uh, and now basically we are requested to be much more open, much more flexible, um, and, and eventually to, to um, you know, integrate services which originally were not at all part of our industry. Thanks, Antonio. So, so maybe I'll ask, we'll stick with Telco just the time being. So uh, Sudir, so um, how do you see things? How do you see the future operating model and uh, and your ability to to architect for every possible outcome and opportunity and every role that you might want to play. Yeah, uh, see, uh, the, the telco in general um, have been um, really caught by surprise um, uh, with the revolutionary digitization of uh, democratized apps uh, because that's what has really happened. And for example, for instance, if I talk about uh, marketing technology, in, uh, there are more than 8,000 apps in the market. And it, it's, it has really created a panic uh, over past few years uh, for telcos and then it's a revolutionary change. And uh, the, so, so telcos are now picking, up, picking it up fast and picking up the pace of uh, digital transformation to really uh, bring up the uh, right uh, combinations uh, for for their customers and also picking up the right um, customers themselves. Now, uh, the, as the environment is changing, then telcos now uh, are in a position to lead that change. And that change is um, uh, primarily in the three dimensions. Uh, one is the business innovation driven, another is technological innovation driven, and Third one is the organization transformation. And uh, all of them, um, talking about Airtel, it has been operations for more than 25 years. And I would say on all of the three uh, legs of this tripod, there they, they, they has been a perpetual um, you know, growth and perpetual transformation. Uh, on the uh, business uh, innovation side, uh, what I see is, uh, is really a challenge or an opportunity for telcos to go much beyond connectivity 
and um, um, instead of becoming uh, providers of connectivity, work on the digital solution providers and uh, with the concepts like digital stores and innovate with the new set of products or uh, bundles and uh, uh, the, the scalable architecture of e-commerce. Um, so it's just things that uh, we are bundling the telecom services as well as OTT services, SaaS services, cloud with that, and maybe some piece of uh, the, the data center, uh, et cetera, for our B2C, B2B, or B2B2C uh, partner ecosystem. And we see um, the customer as one customer for us, uh, for the, the uniform digital experience across various lines of businesses. And customer sees us as one organization. Uh, and mind you, there are more challenges when we club with the, the, the other part of the um, uh, offerings. Uh, in case of Airtel, we have Airtel Payment Bank and uh, Airtel uh, Wink Music. So it's a, there's a music app. Um, the second so, so piece... Sudeh, if, I can get, if I can just stop you, Sudeh. So I think what some people might not be aware of was just how much you needed to change as an organization to respond to the threat when, when Geo came in. And, and that's quite a story in itself. So I think when it comes to your ability to, um, to change, to pivot, you've already been through that, haven't you? It, it, I mean, can you just walk us through what you had to do as an organization to respond to this massive new player coming in from nowhere and basically offering connectivity for, you know, maybe a tenth of the price of what it cost before? Yeah, see, uh, the the transformation uh, in Airtel, uh, I mean, of course, I've been working with Geo also in my earlier uh, uh, tenure, and I've seen all that journey. Now, if I talk about the transformation in Airtel, as I've been pointing out, there has been perpetual transformation for uh, for uh, last, last 25 years, and the digital trans transformation actually had kicked off uh, before uh, the Geo's uh, uh, competition. Second point is uh, the segments, um, uh, the GEO uh, considered the prepaid as the main segment and uh, the mass market as the main segment. And for Airtel, definitely that was and uh, additional segments. So they're the, the postpaid, uh, the high ARPU customers and the B2B segment. And there are multiple lines of businesses, not only the mobility prepaid and postpaid, but the broadband and the fixed line and the DTH offering, which is the direct to home and satellite TV. And there are B2B data circuits like ILL MPLS, and there are surveillance products, IoT products, and a number of them, apart from the banking and music application. So it was definitely a challenge, but the architecturally, technically, as well as the business innovation was already on, and Airtel is um, now all, all gaining uh, on all fronts. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. So now I want to give the technology partners a chance to reply. So, Danielle, I mean, I I'm guessing that you speak to an awful lot of telcos in different parts of the world, big, small, yeah. incumbent, new players. How do you see that readiness? Can you give a single answer or do you see a, a range of different levels of readiness? Yeah, I mean, I think it's always going to be a range depending on, you know, your financial status, the continent you're on, um, and like the competitive threats and headwinds that you're, you're facing. But I think what's really interesting about this moment in our industry is that we have not one, but two really big technological shifts that telcos need to deal with. And that is number one, open RAN, which I think is a, you know, back to your openness comment. Um, you know, big idea that I think a lot of the big players are starting to test out and experiment with, again, different speeds on different continents with different size players. And I think the other thing is the thing I talk about all the time, which is the coming of the public cloud and the opportunity that that brings. And so I think, you know, sprinkling these technologies in a telco doesn't you know, change things and make it better. Does it just because you start playing with them or experimenting with it doesn't mean that you're you're ready for this coming change. I think you know, Sadir mentioned it um, when he was talking about about um, you know how you get ready for this, and that is, I think there's an HR component, right, which hardly ever comes up in panel discussions about operational readiness, but actually having a strategic partner that's a part of the leadership team that's talking about 
you know, not only why are we going to go through this big transformation or this big change, you know, what are our goals and what are we trying to achieve? But I think a big important part is taking your people along with you on that journey and getting them excited to help you in rolling out new ideas and pivoting like Sadir had to do with Geo, right? You've got to really energize that employee base to help you. So, uh, so I'm going to ask you a very blunt question, Daniel. I mean, we talk about new opportunities in 5G edge, telco to techco. It, is it just talk? Is that just talk or telco is ready to make it happen? Um, I, I do see some people who are really trying to do things differently. I think, you know, Vodafone, uh, big uh, TM forum, open API supporter. Yeah. I think they're authentically, you know, they're, they say things from multiple people, not just one person, but you know, we're picking cloud native tools, we're putting the customer first, we're trying to transform. I mean, you are seeing uh, words out there in the market, but then you see the other side, which is people are like, ah, I signed a big deal with, said a strategic partnership with Google, and then you don't really hear from them again about it. And so yeah. I think I think there is some authentic movement and people really trying to change. But you know, in terms of telco, you know, transformation speed. It is still relatively slow. I mean, these are large companies typically. Yeah. It takes a and, and networks and and these ideas are hard to get to market. And so, yeah. um, and, you know, thinking like a startup and thinking like a software company, that speed is very different than where we are today. And, and, and some and sometimes I think that you know the people at the top have this vision. They think they know where they they think they know where they want to get to, but <laughs> it doesn't always get communicated and prioritized if you go down two, three, four, five yeah. levels. Cascading and messages. And particularly the, you know, the, the new starters, they'll be keen. If you bring sort of new people with software skills, and analytics skills, they'll be keen to, but it's the people who are two levels above that are maybe the challenge. I was talking to a big provider in the United States a couple of weeks ago, and they're like, you know, and I, I talk about a lot of crazy ideas, you know, using machine learning and AI and hyper-personalized yeah. plans and super apps. And I talk about all these crazy things. And he's like, you know, DR, we talk about those things and we have, we have teams inside of our organization that are working on it. Our biggest problem, execution. Yeah. We can't get it across the line. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Thank you. Sam, apologies for keeping you waiting, but, uh, but thank you very much indeed. So, I mean, you have a very interesting role at, at BMC. You know, your role is there driving innovation. So I, I guess a lot of your time is spent talking to telcos and, uh, and understanding their readiness for these brave new futures. Yeah, maybe I'd ask this, a similar question to ask Danielle, which is, do you see uniformity across telcos or do you see a huge amount of difference in terms of their, their readiness? And any particular sort of good examples you'd like to pull out of telcos doing things you think are particularly interesting? Thank you. Uh. I'm muted here, but um, no, so I, I agree with all of the panelists here and, and uh, they have provided great input on uh, uh, different various um, aspects of what we're doing. So uh, on your particular question mark, right? So I definitely see working with telcos around the world, whether they're in South America or, or Europe or, or what have you, right? I don't see, for me at least, I don't see the uniformity, right? They are very niche in their markets, very niche in the regions within those markets, um, as an example, and uh, more focused on, on different uh, various needs, right? So, so naturally when, you know, for us as a software company, um, you know, we, we feel that, you know, I, I can't create a global solution, right? Whether like, like DR mentioned, right? About, you know, you know the, the infusion of, of AI and machine learning and so on. And, you know, does that accelerate or what that does? So in my opinion, you know, I, I feel that in the current era, telcos find themselves at these crossroads, right? They either think around, you know, the edge to achieve some incremental gains or they got to make this bold choice to reinvent their value creation uh, formula and bravely uh, and firmly commit to that choice, right? Seizing that opportunity to create uh, more of a permanent role for themselves in a world uh, that has honestly, as we all know, has been reshaped by this pandemic that put a lot of these telcos at the center of this action. Um, and so, and you know, and I feel uh, that the next generation of telcos, right? will have to be defined by leaders who can act at this point, risking this short-term uh, incumbency advantages, right? That I see a lot of them taking to see, you know, to seize untapped growth, right? Within regions, within markets, 
Um, and, you know, I think the current moment really, def, you know, demands this holistic uh, future back approach to transformation uh, where these leaders need to deliver these four or five like integrated changes to reset that Talco's DNA, in my view. Yeah. And, and maybe, and this is me speaking rather than you, Sam, maybe it's the case that, that an, until the threat of disruption exceeds their ability to manage and manage costs and manage margins until it becomes too great, until it's clear to investors that actually something needs to be done, maybe not enough will be done. Maybe, maybe and I think we're in a phase now of telcos thinking they're doing just enough and maybe investors not necessarily having clarity about what three to five years looks like. And actually, I do think as an industry, we need to work harder at enlightening shareholders what three to five years looks like that could also help telcos, I think, as well, interestingly enough. But, uh, but thank you anyway. So, Antonio, I'm going to ask you a, a, a tough question. And I'll ask you it anyway. And, and this is around vision. And, and I appreciate that, um, that you know, the vision is responsibility of the whole the board of the company. And you're just part of that decision, Daniel, uh, Antonietta. So when it comes to that vision and having a vision to enable you to put in place the right operating model, um, do you feel that there's enough clarity about that vision, about what the operator stands for, where it's going? Y you can feel free to depersonalize the answer if you want to, Antonietta. I, I have no problems with that. I think, I think probably there is no 100% full clarity on that uh, in yeah. general. You see different telco in Europe, but in general in the world, taking also different roads. Uh, there are, you know, telco that are focused more on the cable connectivity from service provider. There are telco that are investing more in the digital part, in the service provider part. So I think in general, every telco is trying to figure out how the next three, five years look like, and, and eventually they build up a, a, a different plan based on also which kind, which kind of investor they have, uh, you know, uh, in the background um, but in general I think there are some points which are very very clear and common uh, and probably the execution part is not that clear but obviously to be in the front forefront of digitalization and and uh, uh, to boost uh, the high level connectivity this is uh, something that everybody has in common and then how to go there if you go there through partnership if you build everything on your own um, if you, you know, decouple Netco from Opco, if you keep them together and you invest uh, in ecosystem, these are all different strategy, but uh, I mean, they all have in common this need of boosting the connectivity and boosting the digital world and seeing also the telco as the enabler of, of the digitalization of the future. Um, probably in the next uh, six months, one year, we will see this road getting more clear, but we will see eventually also different telco taking different path and not necessarily one is successful and the other is not. Maybe also yeah. you know, completely different model can succeed uh, uh, on that. It, thank you. I, I, I caught up with all of you yesterday and in my conversation with Daniela, I talked about, remember Daniela, I, I said to you, when you think about telco business, there's three things that telcos do. They do connectivity and traditional comm services. They resell stuff, as in they resell hardware, software, consumer enterprise, mm -hmm. and they do services, professional services, managed services. I personally find this a very helpful way of thinking about telco expansion and growth. And, uh, and you know, when we talk about connectivity, the reason I think we're quite challenged today is when we think about connectivity, on the one hand, we're saying connectivity is a commodity. We need to do something different. On the other hand, we're saying it's all about network slicing. Well, isn't network slicing connectivity? So we ourselves are very, very confused about, I believe, this is, this is me, not you, but my thing is we're a little bit confused about where the future potential growth lies. Is it as a connectivity provider or someone that has great end user relationships or is it so? That, that's, that's not leading to a particular question, but I think that's why I think the discussion is difficult because, because we're not particularly clear about what the new revenue streams are or how they'll come. So, yeah. Sudhir, if I can come to you, Airtel. 
how clear is your roadmap, your vision? If I was to ask you, do you know where you'll be, where, where the, the company wants to be in five years' time? Are you, are you pretty clear on that? Yes, I think there is enough clarity on that. And um, uh, of course, the bread and butter of telcos have been connectivity and there has been uh, a great uh, evolution as well as revolution in the connectivity world. And with the 5G auctions um, shortly happening in India, it's uh, really a big uh, market for innovation. But having said that, connectivity per se is not going to create the perpetual value in the market for the telcos. And um, uh, if, I, if you know, I take the example of 5G, it's, it's, uh, there are three things definitely. One thing is the enhanced mobile broadband, another is uh, ultra reliable low latency communication, and another is this massive um, IoT. So and now uh, with, with these constructs and the network slicing, network function virtualization, uh, it, it's not that consumer is asking for just more bandwidth. Consumer is asking for the innovation in the services. And when telcos have to move up the value chain, that is where um, uh, the, the real uh, value lies. And that's where uh, anyway, uh, other uh, players are, uh, are eating, up, eating up the pie. Now we have a very clear vision in this direction that we are working towards the digital transformation, providing um, the digital services, uh, positioning ourselves as um, the digital solution providers. And uh, that includes the connectivity and uh, all, the, all the three uh, aspects which you talked about, the connectivity as well as the reselling, the OTTs or SaaS or whatever products and then providing the solutions and uh, also we have uh, uh, certain um, areas like uh, cloud where we are talking about uh, multi-cloud hybrid cloud and cloud and customer and prepare a gtm for our b2b customers where they are looking much more than just connectivity and they are looking for the whole solution and also the 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 digital marketplace uh, to provide the right ease for all kinds of uh, customer whether they are b2b or b2c yeah Thank you. Um, I'm going to come back to you, uh, Antonio. When you need to drop off, don't worry, just do so. So when you when you when you need to go, turn your camera off, and we'll say goodbye. But I'll carry on talking to Sadir. But stay as long as you can. Um, so so Sadir, so interesting. So you talked about a whole range of new opportunities, you know, marketplaces, cloud. I guess operationally, there is a discussion to be had ar around how you organise yourselves for the legacy business on the one hand and the new business on the other and whether the new business sits outside of that um, outside of the connectivity business operationally or whether the operational people actually have quarter of their time or half the time spent doing new stuff so do you feel that that as an industry we, we've worked out the best approach yet in terms of how, how to do that I don't think uh, we have, um, as an industry, we have found the right formula or the best approach. But uh, what we are um, uh, targeting uh, this as uh, making the ease for the customers. So um, I, I talked about the digital marketplace for both B2C and B2B. So we are coming up uh, with various architectural constructs uh, wherein we are able to bundle the uh, propositions. One of the bundles we have already floated in the market and it is uh, doing pretty well. It's, it's a program called Airtel Black, uh, which is already a combination of a uh, number of uh, connectivity services. And there are options of soft bundles to top it up uh, with certain OTT and SaaS products. And then um, this has its own challenges in terms of uh, uh, creating the right partner ecosystem and also enabling it. So uh, if, if I talk about, uh, you know, certain basic principles, what we, we are trying to um, follow, then that is um, creating the right business capability matrix. And uh, that is in line with our mission, vision and mission in a structured way. And then transforming them from a typical systems and applications to platform and capabilities. 
So yeah. the moment uh, we come to the platforms, then it's a, a combination of the right people, process, technology, interfaces. And that's where we plug in our um, partners seamlessly. And uh, we, we, we create the right API culture and self-serve and creating the data democratization, innovation democratization, and right policies and principles for cloudification and containerization and bring the right automation and governance. So these are various pieces we are working and uh, perhaps uh, a right combination is going to uh, provide a winning formula to the industry in the market. Thank you, Sudhir. So um, thank you for your questions coming. So Roland Leonard, thank you very much. And, uh, and I'm gonna ask you, Roland, if you, if you can translate this for me in your next question. So Roland said, to bounce off Antonietta's response slightly provocatively, Guillaume Boutin, who I'm guessing is the CEO of Proxima said, dans 10 ans, Proxima sera un GAFA belge. I've got no idea what that means, Roland. So maybe, may, maybe you can inform us what a GAFA, what a GAFA belge is, but um, I'm sure we're very interesting. Um, and then Roland's also said, talked about the enterprise market and saying, you know, if we're all convinced the future is a B2B market, and I think the industry has decided the future is a B2B market, then don't we really need to, uh, to get obsessed about understanding what our customers want uh, and then step back to design the horizontal model? And I think I'd agree with that. You need, to, uh, you need to get to understand your customers first before you can decide what you need to build for them. So it has to be done iteratively. Um, so, um, Danielle, back to you. So, um, you know, how do you feel this conversation sits in terms of vision and operational model? And maybe, maybe I can, maybe I can relate this specifically to what you do in in your yeah, what you do sure. in day to day, Danielle. And you're a public cloud evangelist, and <laughs> uh, and and I guess you can be an evangelist to the network team in telco or the IT team. Or, or the B2B team. And yeah. hopefully those people will all talk to each other and come up with a, with, with a, a common view of the world. I mean, do, do you sense that when you speak to those different functions, there's alignment in terms of where they're going from a vision, from a vision perspective? Yeah, you know what I, I think is really interesting is, um, you know, the industry is obviously battling OTT players siphoning the ARPU. I mean, I mean, telcos still have great businesses, but if you look at the long history of the last, since the iPhone was introduced in 2007, right, in general, ARPU is being eroded yeah. by some of these OTT players, right? right? Out of the same mouth, you hear words like, you know, it's all about the customer experience. We're going to focus on the customer. But at the end yeah. of the day, when you look at commercials in any country, by the big MNOs, it's all about the network, the network. Did I tell you about our network, right? And it's not messages about the experience, right? And I'll, I'll make an analogy to airline companies, right? Airline companies don't say, please be our customer because we have Airbuses, right? Or please be our customers because we're a Boeing company, right? Similar story, highly regulated industry. Um, most of their CapEx spent on their planes, but they don't sit there and necessarily brag about, hey, it's about the plane. They're like, we give you the best nuts or we treat you the best. We have these cool fancy Porsches that will pick up our best yeah. customers when they're running late. And so the airline industry, you know, sort of does that. They focus on the customer. Now, I, Telco talks about it. I think we still have the lowest NPS across all industries. Um, when you compare yourself to an OTT player, their NPS is in the high 60s or 70s. And so I, I see words from CEOs like, oh, yeah, we're yeah. going to bring our NPS up. And I'm like, it's mm -hmm. not just up. It's not just better. you got to double it or triple it. Yeah. So, 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 so it's interesting. I mean, when, when you hear Jeff Bezos speaks and he has his annual letter to shareholders and every time he talks about, about customers and he says, if you win the customer battle, you don't worry about your competition. And uh, and uh, and telco, I think telcos have talked about investing in customer experience. But my sense, Danielle, is that making it better than it was is too often good enough. Uh, and and well, maybe I mean, maybe I think, that's the issue. I think telcos compare themselves to the customer experience that their nearest competitor is providing, and I think they need to compare and benchmark themselves against what Apple and Amazon and Netflix do. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, when I talk, I talk about charging. Let's talk about charging for a second. Right. Where people are like, it needs to be real time. You need to catch those prepaid people the minute that they run out of 
out of credit because we don't want them to have one penny extra of airtime. <laughs> and I'm like, and then you look at what Amazon does. Like, for example, I bought I bought something on Amazon the other day. It wasn't the right thing. I go to return it. They're like, don't return it. Just keep it. We're yeah, good. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just a completely different bar. And I'm like, and again, I was talking with with a telco and they're like, oh, we had this great conversation about it's all about the ex customer experience. And then 30 minutes later, it was like, how do you catch those those abusers? And I stopped <laughs> the conversation. I was like, how what percentage of people are really abusing it? Like, is it like 50% of your subscribers have like figured out how to gain your plans? It's like 1%. And you're like, you're, you're making your entire subscriber base suffer because you're trying to catch those 1% of users. Let that go. Just let it go. Yeah. And maybe focus on providing that customer experience so that not only you're attracting people, you're like, oh, that telco is cool. They're, yeah. They let my calls go through and then they force me to the top up. They're cool, right? You'll attract people and maybe reduce churn. And yes, maybe you'll have like a little bit of abuse, but it's okay. But I think it's because we're so focused on monetizing the network and forgetting the bigger picture, which is, attracting subscribers and and really giving them a great experience and i don't see that happening around i see people you know there's like pockets well, but it, in it, general it, it it seems as if many operators now are creating these second brands and maybe maybe they're doing the second brands because doing it with your own brand they maybe think it's hard to do well it's maybe scary it right it's your crown it. jewels but, they're crown but, jewels what if you screw it up don't want to but I, I would argue you probably need to spend more money on your customer experience. And I think when you look at how much you invest spending the network every single day and what you spend on customer experience, it's probably it's probably not enough. Correct. It's probably the reason. Correct. And I think if you want to differentiate yourself, like I mean, in the United States, I live in the United States. We have you know the, the three you know three almost four guys, and. You know, I couldn't tell you, like, is this network better than the other one? I mean, I just tell you because I drive in their spots, right? And I think where the, where the differentiation comes from is that customer experience. And I think we need to start doing that. And you're right. I mean, we I talk about the public cloud a lot. And that's because I see telcos spending their organizational energy, their budgets on teams that are managing the plumbing of IT, right? When you could outsource this or give it to the hyperscalers yeah. Yeah. and rent it, rent their talent for you to manage your workloads and manage your machines and give you access to the best chips and the fastest infrastructure in the world. Um, and you could rent that, you could just buy it. So, you should do that and like reallocate your budget to focus on experience. So it does make me wonder, Danielle, whether deep down, deep, deep down, do telcos really believe that, that a, a, a vastly superior NPS makes you a more profitable company? And all I can assume is they don't all believe that, because if they did believe that, then we wouldn't be where we are today. Well, they got their butts kicked by Apple when Apple introduced the iPhone. They were in charge of designing all of those devices. And then Steve Jobs was like, hands off, I'm designing a great experience. Yeah, yeah. And it just completely shifted. Voice went to zero and data came up and it was like, oh my God. I think and and Apple designed that phone with the consumer in mind, right? Yeah. But the end user in mind, and I think we need yeah. to do that in telco. Uh, so, so Sam, just moving the discussion on a little bit and just in, into where I guess Daniel and I have taken this conversation around customer experience. I mean, um, and this isn't really discussion around around operational models, but I think it, it is an ingredient to it as well. Do do you see telcos? many good examples of telcos um, turning themselves outward, becoming more customer experience centric uh, and, that being, and that being part of a vision? I mean, can, can your vision be to have fantastic customer experience? Is that in itself a good enough vision? And do you see it happening in any pockets around the world? Yeah, so I, I, I think, um, you know, going to what DR said, you know, I completely agree with that, you know, we are, uh, when we talk to a lot of the telcos, naturally there's so much emphasis on the network and uh, very less emphasis on the customer service and customer service management, right? You know, a, a part of the business. But I do see um, uh, maybe, maybe as not much in North America, in, in my opinion, but uh, I, I see that little bit of a, a, a twist and, and turn that's happening in parts of Europe uh, and, and especially Australia, right? You know, where, you know, we had. Uh, meeting with one of the largest uh, providers in, in Australia. And I was surprised to see some of the things that they're doing in order to actually enhance some of the 
the customer focus abilities, right? I mean, simple things, um, you know, which is uh, a lot of these telcos now are bundling these services together, right? So there's a little more, uh, a customer basically is paying one bill, right? Or, you know, his one, one he's not, uh, he or she is not calling somebody uh, from their network, uh, from, for their phone and, and their, their PC, uh, or sorry, their, uh, you know, whatever, their mobile phone provider, yeah, their yeah, cable yeah. provider, and so on and so on. So the experience is becoming a little more tight, right, within within that scope, right? And so you'll see a lot of the bigger vendors like the, uh, the Comcast of the world and, and others jumping into the fray as well, right, you know, trying to, to capitalize on these markets. So I think that's, you know, my, in my opinion, I think that's really where they're truly uh, trying to organize themselves and trying to get to the level, uh, uh, you know, where, um, you know, the other other vendors are, like the Apples and the uh, AWSs of the world. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, Sudhir, I mean, if we just turn and think about these, you know, new technologies, IoT, cloud, edge 5G, I mean, um, it's, it's not always just a question of deploying these new technologies. It's, it's organizing yourself to properly use them. Probably really true in terms of public cloud, I guess, but probably true of all of them generally. Um, do you see enough attention being paid? To, but I guess the temptation is just to, to launch a new service or bring a new technology and keep your organizational structure intact. But do you feel that that you can be brave, that you can do things differently, you can rip up an organizational structure and start again? Is that something you're prepared to do? Yeah, so at Airtel, what we do is uh, we don't see technology as technology per se. Technology is um, seen at Airtel as an enabler of the right customer experience, uh, which is the right digital experience. Um, of course, uh, with the technology, uh, we, we get the right uh, tools for the agility and velocity, whether it is uh, network technology or whether it is the IT technology or the various um, architectural patterns we implement in the um, IT side. So uh, technology becomes enabler for our uh, velocity, quality, agility, and with the right processes, we achieve them. At Airtel, we are uh, fully geared up uh, for the technological challenges. And uh, if I talk about the 5G, um, then it is definitely bringing us, uh, bringing uh, to plate a lot of new possibilities. Because if I see the spectrum efficiency, which is uh, maybe three times, and then there are uh, some latency figures, which are, which we end up getting one millisecond latency. Uh, those kinds of applications um, clubbed with the uh, clouds, uh, various options in the edge cloud especially, brings up a lot of uh, uh, new possibilities. So if I talk about the um, gamifications or AR, VR, uh, and um, uh, some IoT applications, um, uh, the, 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 uh, really the opportunities are enormous. Um, so in short term, uh, definitely there are uh, certain things in terms of upselling smartphone users to more expensive 5G packages, but that is not the, not the uh, right strategy only because in the long term, uh, what we have on plate is, is really a huge uh, set of use cases where we are talking about the smart vehicles. We are already operating in the IoT area and in the M2M segment where we are- uh, So I, I, I'm gonna ask you a, a provocative question today. So on the one hand, we're saying that we think the future is B2B and we think the, the way to leverage 5G is B2B. If that is the case, shouldn't your B2B function be responsible for your 5G network strategy, or at least have co-responsibility for it. And, and is that happening? Because my observation is that that is a problem today. Uh, and, and operators are undertaking 5G network investment, the same way they did 2G and 3G and 4G. It really hasn't changed. And the B2B guys are focused on the here and now of making the next quarter profits. They're not focused on what they can do with 5G three years down the line. So do we not need to rethink when we deploy a new network technology 
why we're doing it, who we're doing it for, how we how, how we leverage it in those B2B in those B2B opportunities. Yeah, so uh, at Airtel, uh, we have a very clear vision on the, the B2B side where uh, 5G is definitely one of the enablers of the uh, various new use cases which are coming up. Airtel, um, uh, just to highlight, is uh, having the strongest uh, uh, enterprise side offering revenues uh, um, in India. And um, uh, we, we have a very strong uh, business team and technology team uh, backing the, uh, the, the B2B side. And we are also topping up with the, with the newer opportunities with products like Airtel IQ uh, we have launched recently. And that is for our B2B segment. And uh, then on the IoT, as I was uh, explaining um, that we are tying up with the various automobile manufacturers for the M2M market. And we have got really large orders. Uh, if I talk about the industrial automation, uh, they, we are we, we are already um, gearing up for that. And then um, the the uh, specific uh, uh, you know uh, the smart city kind of initiatives or selling the network slices etc. It requires a huge B two B ecosystem which is uh, pretty strong in case of uh, Airtel. And uh, we are already in talks with a uh, number of our partners. Now, this is one piece. But if I talk about uh, further uh, in terms of uh, uh, go to market for our uh, B2B2C uh, kind of segment, where we help our partners or, uh, for that matter, customers in B2B segment to serve their customers. And uh, that is um, uh, one piece where we are working with them for our various cloud offerings, various data center offerings. Um, uh, and uh, the security solutions, and of course, uh, the high speed connectivity and various use cases there. So we are all geared up for that, and uh, we are best uh, placed uh, in the best position, at least in India. Thanks, Uday. Uh, and Danielle, you know, when you evangelize, you know, do you, who do you like to evangelize to? Are you happy to evangelize to a CIO? a CTO, someone that heads the B2B line of business, the CEO, all of the above? Yeah, I mean, it is It is pretty much uh, the C-suite, I think, especially when I'm talking about the public cloud. I mean, I'm talking about a pretty significant technological shift, a platform change, um, changing how they do business. And so, you know, a, you know, a mid-tier, you know, director even, right, is not going to make that kind of decision for the organization. They might, they might dabble, they might experiment. But in terms of like, you know, fulsome shift in the way the operations within a telco move, I mean, that is a C-suite conversation. And so, you know, you're talking to the CFO about the cost savings opportunities of the move, right? Like how much can you save? Can you reduce your data centers? Can you reduce your CapEx expense on, on the IT side? What can you do, um, you know, with, you know, less so am I talking about open RAM, but I think coupling open Open RAM with public cloud is a really, really great idea. And we can talk about like some of the monetization ideas there. But um, so I'll, I'll talk to the CFO about cost savings. I'll talk to the CTO and the CIO about lower TCO, better technological advantages. I'll talk to a CMO about creating great customer experience and hyper, you know, subscribers want to be seen. They want to be known by their telco, right? And so the CMO is really excited to do that. Um, and then of course the CEO is balancing the two, right? The both, you know, revenue generating, how do I keep and grow my revenue and how do I reduce my expenses? And so I think it's it's that whole group that I'm talking to and hopefully uh, and so, energizing about so this. To this point about these new technologies, open RAN, edge, IoT, I mean, if we look at how telcos have endeavoured to introduce new technologies and capabilities, telcos are great at rolling out new macro networks, not always so great at leveraging new technologies, which, which are not part of their network, I would say. Um, and, you know, would you subscribe to the view that, that, that you do need to sort of be prepared to change your organisational, your operating model? in order to leverage those, those, those technologies? Or can you just do it within how you work currently? Yeah, I mean, I guess, yeah, I think you need to change the way the way you think in, internally. Again, I'm going to bring it back to HR, right? Typically yeah. inside of a telco, the power base, right? Like when you think about who has power within an organization, the power within telcos is typically with network 
Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And maybe exactly. number two is finance. And so, and that's just because that's where the money is spent. Right. But, you know, you think about, you know, what you need to do to roll out new technologies because you're trying to monetize some new idea. And then maybe it is around MPS and, and customer experience. And so how big is marketing's voice in a particular telco? Right. I mean, it's not one or two. Right. And until telcos are like, we're willing to give marketing a, a bigger voice in our organization so that we're rolling out new ideas much more quickly. And the CTO is, is on board with that. And network is willing, is understanding that, you know, we're important, right? We're table stakes. If our network doesn't work, you know, we don't have subscribers, but we're not like, the, we're not the ones that are dictating what's going on. It, it's now marketing. When I start yeah. to see that happen, I think that's when I start to think that's a telco that's really looking to change, right? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. I see telcos that don't want to give up all the things they used to do, and they're trying to do all the new ideas that are coming. And I think what's really important about strategy is deciding what you're going to do and what you're going to stop doing. What do you yeah. say no to, right? And so you can get your teams energized about what we're focused on and get them marching in the right direction. And that's alignment. I think that's all leadership. And so, um, yeah, so I think I think it's a little bit still, I'm going to bring it back to HR and, and what you need to do to really drive change and, and change your operational model. Uh, have we lost Sam? I think we've lost, have we lost Sam? I think we've lost Sam, haven't we? Yeah. Sam, are you there? Um, Mark, I have uh, uh, a bit of top up on that. How sure, far away on this um, organization transformation because, as I told, the business uh, innovation technology innovation is one, and how we gear up uh, in the organization is uh, what is important. And that's where we have a, a, a bit of more structured approach where uh, we take the business capability map uh, path. And we define that what all typical capability the organization uh, as a whole is going to have and create platforms around that, create teams which own the platform and the interfaces or APIs around it and um, talk about the API product managers. And they, they so all the uh, people are uh, organized around platforms and uh, that's how we scale. So, uh, and then second piece is uh, the democratization process uh, where the, if I talk, for example, if I talk about the uh, data strategy. So the data strategy is that availability of the data for any platform in real time, um, take to take the real time decisions with the real time analytics. So if suppose we create right data platforms for enabling the team for uh, any team uh, and, and create the right democratization infrastructure, then that enables everybody. And then the organization scales. Uh, so that is uh, another piece. And similarly, we talk about the innovation democratization where yeah. multiple platforms and all, they, they are uh, freely allowed to uh, develop their own applications and all by just consuming, uh, discovering and consuming the various APIs and capabilities which they can leverage. So that's how the organization transformation uh, has to move around. And, and out of interest, do we think that um, it, the role of the IT function is evolving or needs to involve to be more of a sort of customer facing, market facing business function rather than the good old fashioned operations team? Is that something that you think about Sudhir in terms of you know, how you can contribute to, to helping the business leverage these new technologies? Yes, definitely. So the um, the IT department, uh, per I mean, uh, traditionally speaking, information technology department is uh, does not work anymore in isolation. And uh, we have uh, you know pods where we have a business team, the engineering team, which is IT team, and the product team are part of the same pod. And there are multiple pods for delivering various business capabilities. They define together what is the right customer experience, what is the right uh, uh, portfolio mix we should offer to the customer, and how do we deliver, how, the, how we achieve the scalable architecture. So all of these collaborate uh, in an agile manner, and that's how the delivery is done. So it's not something like IT team does in isolation and tries to think about the strategy. It's a win-win situation for everybody to collaborate and join hands and provide the real customer experience. 
Thanks, Olivia. And Danielle, from what you observe, do you see, when we think about these new technologies, I guess what I'm trying to drive at here is that most of the knowledge about the new technologies, if you say cloud, for example, good example, yeah. public cloud, resides within the, within the IT function. That's where there's most familiarity with it. But those guys and girls are often seen as being people that manage costs yeah. rather than people yeah. enabling new services and business models. So again, going back to operating models, do telcos need to do more, do we think, to get those people who really understand the power of these technologies sitting in roles which are closer to the customer? Well, I don't even think we have those people in IT today that right. really understand cloud. Like, the way I talk about cloud. So the way right, I talk right, about right. cloud is a lot of people look at the big hyperscalers as a way to outsource your data center, right? It's not this workload isn't work, you know, being run under my roof, it's being run under the roof of AWS or Google or Azure. And what people need to realize is that, you know, those the hyperscalers are providing software available to you, an API call away that you can assemble like almost like building blocks, like, oh, I'm going to build a new application. Um, I'm going to build it on AWS. I need video conferencing. I'm going to pull in Chime. I need ticketing. I'm going to use AWS Connect, right? I'm going to do some analytics against it. I'm going to bring in QuickSight. And like within, you know, a day, you've assembled a new application yeah. without having to write a lot of code. And I don't think, I don't hear those stories about like, hey, we're generating, we're, we're big on AWS and we're generating all, the, all these ideas. And so I think, um, you know, if you're really excited about doing some of these big ideas, right? You know, um, the metaverse has been a big new buzzword that's come around in the last probably three months, right? You want to do, you know, hyper-personalized plans. You want to build your super app, right? Where we are today, we don't have the talent in telcos to start doing that. So you got to start somewhere. You got to start experimenting with your IT. Take the dusty old application, IT application that no one cares about. That's from like 1972. It's running under someone's desk i guarantee you someone has a server under their desk that's running something we don't know we're afraid to turn it off it has dust on it right and move that to the public cloud and how uh -huh. hard was that and, and and start to experiment and i think we need our I, i'll let you in in two seconds i think we need our, <laughs> IT, our it teams to start to experiment like that really quickly and and start with like low risk applications that isn't like setting the world on fire but like that starts them playing in those sandboxes right so, and, so and i and I do think they need to sit closer to the business and understand what they're trying uh, to achieve. Is the issue, Danielle, that there's a lack of skills or it's a culture mindset around what my job is to do? Well, I think it's both. I think it is very threatening to a CTO and a CIO's group to hear, like, you know, stuff that I talk about all the time, you know, let's move to the public cloud. And I think a lot of people, again, it's that I have, I have 10 years in HR, so I talk about HR a lot, right? Yeah. You know, you think about, people's, you know, they're threatened in terms of what does that mean for my job and what does that mean for my organization? I think of myself as managing the data centers and now I'm not doing it in that anymore. Do they need me? And I'm like, well, flip that into the opportunity that it is, which is public cloud skills are the hottest tech skills yeah. on the market. Yeah. People yeah. who know how to really use AWS and build applications really quickly, their pay goes up 20 to 30%, right? And so, you know, see that as an opportunity, but um, no, I don't think those skills exist. I think you need to start investing on how you're going to get your teams um, trained on this, right? And then you need to hire and you're going up against the world's best technologists, yeah, right? I mean, yeah, this yeah. is the hottest, right? Like, how are you going to compete against an AWS tech, yeah. you know, uh, compensation package that's offering hot equity? Yeah. So so I'm going to leave you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. So I'll leave you the last word here, this. So in, in terms of the skills part of operating models, um, to, uh, how, you, you, I mean, I guess you're a, you're a huge organization. You live in a country where there's a lot of talent. So I, I guess it, it's skills a challenge for you. Are you doing enough in terms of bringing new skills? Uh, so skills per se, I, I won't say uh, a challenge, but the, the challenge, the bigger challenge is the availability of resources. That's uh, something as we are scaling, um, uh, we, we are on the almost, um, verge of ending the pandemic, and, uh, and the the suddenly the surge is there everywhere, and then um, the right retaining the right skills and hiring the right skills to the scale we want, 
is something which is important. But again, there are uh, certain technological uh, directions we are taking, which is uh, more towards uh, no code or zero code, as uh, DR was also mentioning, is something like assembly of various functions across the multi-cloud and then creating an application and operationalizing it very quickly. So uh, in the second piece, we are working on uh, various aspects of self-heal where uh, the, the technology itself sorts out many of the problems uh, of the customer. And then uh, we talk about self-serve as another principle and the discovery uh, and the democratization and automation. Mm -hmm. So with this, I think uh, that we are trying to cope up uh, with uh, whatever shortage is there. And so that there is a less people dependency and uh, it's uh, more reuse of what all is there and creating and assembling the various capabilities and create new applications. So, uh, but then of course, uh, um, hiring the right skill is always a challenge. We are also coping up with that. Um, there is an abundance uh, in country like India, but there's a huge demand as well. Great, well, I see the time is up. So Sudhir and Danielle, thank you so much. Um, thank you to Sam who uh, seems to have dropped off somewhere and to Antonietta. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, and look forward to seeing you again soon. Danielle, Thanks, today, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye.